Okay. Well, I guess it's time to once again put on the shackles of three-dimensional topology. <laughs> so here we are. So, uh, Don't let the four-dimensional man drive me down. <laughs> right. So, uh, I want to po point out that, you know, I'm going to talk about surfaces in three manifolds. Ron was talking about surfaces in, in four manifolds. Uh, surfaces of, of non-negative Euler characteristic. Uh, play a sort of key role in uh, in three manifold topology. Uh, so let me just remind you of this. I mean, we've talked a bit about this. We've talked about spheres and tori. If you've got a compact manifold, let me just give the definitions. If you've got a two, so what are the surfaces, orientable surfaces of non-negative Euler characteristic? There's the sphere, the disk, the uh, torus and the annulus. And uh, so let me just give a definition of <coughs> if you've got one of these guys sitting in a compact three model for them, let's say that it's essential in these d different cases if, okay, well what's an essential sphere? It's one that does, doesn't bound a ball. So if it's not equal to the boundary of a ball in M, what, what's an essential disk? Well, let's just say an essential disk is a compressing disk in the sense that I defined it earlier. So the boundary of D2 is essential in the boundary of M. The disks are, of course, properly embedded and the annuli are supposed to be properly embedded. And, and, and the tori and annuli, they're going to be essential if they are incompressible and not, uh, not boundary parallel, not sort of parallel into the boundary. So th this definition applies to annuli and tori. And then, as I've described in the, in, the, in the first two lectures, you know, the uh, essential spheres, well, you know, they, they sort of play, they sort of correspond in some sense to the prime decomposition of M, Knazer's theorem, and I guess essential disk, if you want to think of it this way, th they sort of come up if the boundary of M is not empty, you can, you can, you can imagine sort of cutting the manifold along essential disks into canonical pieces. And similarly, we saw that the, you know, essential tori, they corresponded to, sort of cutting along them corresponds to the, what I call the JSJ decomposition of M. So this came up in the, you know, the geometrization conjecture, the cutting of the manifold up. Once it's irreducible, you want to cut it up into geometric pieces. And again, uh, I didn't discuss annuli at that point, but w one could have done. And uh, so they also, they sort of come up uh, in, in uh, what you might also call the JSJ decomposition of M when, when, when the boundary, uh, boundary is not empty. So for example, I mean, here's, just a, here's a theorem that uh, sort of really relates the existence of these surfaces to hyperbolic structures. Um, if we have manifolds with boundary, then the, well, well, well so let, let's say that so M a compact three manifold is hyperbolic, and so in this in this setting, uh, let's sorry with if if its boundary is not empty, right, then M is hyperbolic, and in th in this setting by hyperbolic I want to mean that it's uh, <coughs> if you if you remove the torus components, so let's call it M zero which is M minus the torus components of boundary M. Uh, th that should have a complete hyperbolic structure with with the non-torus boundary components totally geodesic. So, so um, the, the universal covering is going to be, you're just going to see, you know, pieces of uh, hyperbolic three space cut out by these uh, totally geodesic um, planes, and uh, they are going to be the lifts of the non-torus components of, uh, of the boundary. The torus components, they correspond to these sort of cusps, uh, these sort of non-compact ends, which, you know, correspond to parabolic elements of 
PSL2C. Anyway, what's Thurston's theorem? Uh, is it is it th th is that uh, this has a completely topological characterization? It's if and only if M does not contain an essential sphere, disk, annulus, or torus. So that's one way in which uh, you can think of these surfaces as of non-negative Euler characteristic as being a sort of, uh, oh, well, I guess, and not, I guess the three balls are sort of special case, which we should rule out, maybe. Um, so you can think of these surfaces of non-negative Euler characteristics as sort of obstructions to the existence of uh, hyperbolic structures in this sense. And again, the, uh, as we saw, as we sort of discussed last time, you know, if you start with a hyperbolic manifold M, and if M alpha and M beta are, are sort of are not hyperbolic, then you expect the intersection number uh, of delta and alpha. Well, sorry, but maybe before I say that, let's say that suppose M is suppose M is hyperbolic. So maybe I should draw a kind of. Well, let, let me let me okay draw it here. So here, here, here's a sort of typical M. It may have some non-torus boundary components. It may have some torus boundary components. This is not part of the map as to how to get to the, <laughs> get to the thing. And it's got, uh, it's got some, you know, it's got some uh, specified torus boundary component that we're going to do Dane filling along. All right, we're going to choose curves on there. So uh, it, if, M, if M is hyperbolic and M alpha not hyperbolic, um, well, then, let me just, in, in this slightly more different language, then, you see, well, again, wh what could M alpha be? Again, I discussed this in the context of, you know, surgery or not. Again, you could have a counterexample uh, to the geometrization conjecture, so we're not going to worry too much about that. Well, again, it could contain, uh, it could, you know, one of these, one of these uh, surfaces of non-negative Euler characteristics could show up. It, so it could end up containing an essential sphere, disk, annulus, or torus. That would, that would prevent it being hyperbolic. Or it could be, so, so that's the whole story if M alpha has non-empty boundary, you see. Now, but, but of course the case that's really hard, I guess, is when M just has a single boundary component as a torus, and then well, then you have to, um, I mean, if it's not hyperbolic, then it, it, it could be, it could contain a, a, an incompressible torus, but we, we, we've, we've taken account of that. But if, if, if that's not the case, and again, modular geometrization conjecture, it would have to be a ciphered fiber space, okay? And so, let's distinguish the, uh, it could be S3, right? Or it could be a lens space. Or it could be a small site of fiber space, you know, the one with uh, three singular fibers uh, over the two sphere. So, so that, 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 that's the only, this is all that you can, can get. So let me just point out that these two cases can also be described in terms of uh, s surfaces of non-negative order characteristics. Because if you're S3, one way to say that is you, can, you contain a Hagar, you contain a Hagar surface which is a two-sphere. And one way to say that you're a lens space is that you contain a Hagard torus. Um, and in, in some sense, this is perhaps some exp explanation of why, I mean, this, this case, as we'll see, it seems to be, there's the least known about, about this case because it, it's a little bit hard. There's a, there's a, they're annoying little manifolds, these. They're, they're not sort of big enough that you can really apply certain techniques. But on the other hand, they don't have any really sort of interesting surfaces in them, and so um, they're a bit hard to deal with. Well, as I said, you know, the, if you have a hyperbolic manifold and you have two non-hyperbolic fillings, then you expect uh, the intersection number between the two slopes to be small, right? And so one kind of goal here, again, as I say, I discussed this in some detail in the case where one of the fillings is a three sphere. In other words, we're looking at knots in the three sphere. But in this more general context, let's say that we want to 
try to understand uh, just how large these intersection numbers can be. So <coughs> you might want to say that uh, you, you want to do two things here. You want to find, find the maximum value the maximum values of, of these intersection numbers and also again the theme that I uh, sort of elaborated on last time I mean you want to study uh, Sergio knots in S3 and you want to completely describe you know the, the, the knots that do have non-hyperbolic Dane surgeries so in this more general context you want to find this maximum value and then you want to describe I mean some, somehow describe uh, the triples uh, that realize this maximum value, maybe. And, and you want to do this, you see, n n n now, now we've got lots of different cases, because uh, the non-hyperbolicity can be reflected in these, all these different kinds of degenerations. And so you, you want to do this for, for the various pairs. of degenerations. So for example, as I said, I mean, uh, a special case of this would be if you assume that one of the, one of the, surge, one of the fillings uh, is S3, and then you're wondering, you know, um, suppose you have another filling that gives you something that's not hyperbolic. Well, this is exactly what I was discussing last time, so this is just a question of Dane surgery on, on knots in S3, okay? So more generally, you can uh, look at all these different kinds of degenerations. That, and as I say, most of them, you see, can be expressed in terms of certain surfaces showing up, surfaces of non-negative oil accuracy. But let, let, let me just give an example, which again, I actually mentioned uh, last time, the, the figure eight now. So let, let's just give a, this is an opportunity to do that. Simple, simple little proof here. So let, let's take K to be the figure eight knot. So here it is. Now I think I mentioned that, uh, that if you do four and minus four Dane surgery on this, you get a, a toroidal manifold. So he, here's a way to see that. Um, so K is the figure eight knot, and let, let's, let, let me call M sub eight the, uh, the, the exterior of the figure eight knot. Well, let's see. See, there's a surface here, which I can just... See, there's a surface F. So what, what is F? Any takers? How many boundary components does it have? One, okay. What's its Euler characteristic? It's one, two, three, minus one, two, three, four. So it's, it's minus one. And it's non-orientable. And so it's a once punctured Klein bottle, okay. So F is a once punctured, so it's a Klein bottle minus, mi minus, the, minus an open disk. And boundary, the boundary of F, I can think of this as actually sitting, I mean, I can just take out a neighborhood of the knot, right, which, and then I can think of the surface as actually sitting in the exterior, and so the boundary is sort of lying on the boundary of the exterior, so I'm, I'm thinking this is sitting in, in M8. And so the boundary of F is a curve on, on, on the boundary of this manifold, and so it has some, it has some slope, you know, it's, uh, so with the usual parameterization, you know, given by the meridian to longitude, well, it has slope 4. So that's an exercise. In other words, what you, what you have to do here, I mean, it's clearly, it's clearly an integer because, you know, the long, it just goes once round the knot, okay? It intersects the meridian once. What you have to figure out is if you just take a little, you know, push off of the, of the boundary there, uh, how many times does it link? The, the knot, and so I claim it links it four times. 
And I should warn you that the four is not one, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> You'll have points deducted if you say that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's... So now that, th this means that if you now do, if you now do plus four, you know, surgery on this, then you get, it contains, you know, f hat, which is just f union a disk, because by definition, you know, we are sewing in a solid torus so that this curve of slope four bounds a disk in the solid torus, and so you, ne you now get a Klein bottle, f hat. And so now if you take <coughs> a neighborhood of this Klein bottle, in this manifold here, I mean, this will be a twisted eye bundle over the Klein bottle, and so the boundary will just be the twofold covering of the Klein bottle. This is a torus, and it's pretty easy to see that this torus is incompressible, in fact. And okay, so that's, you can sort of see that. Okay, but now, um, yeah. Because the figure eight knot is amphichiral, okay, that means that, you know, there's an orientation reversing automorphism of S3, you know, taking, taking the knot to itself. And so this implies that if you, if you did M over L surgery on K, this would be homeomorphic by an orientation reversing homeomorphism to K minus M over L surgery. And so therefore, uh, therefore K minus four is also, also contains uh, an essential torus. Okay, so uh, <coughs> notice that, again, this is, what's the, diff the, the distance, the intersection number between these two slopes? You have these two toroidal Dane surgeries, and the distance, of course, is eight. Another numeral numerological coincidence, uh, <laughs> the figure eight knot. Um, so that's, so this shows, you see, that if we're interested in the, the kind of degeneration where you start with a hyperbolic manifold, you do a couple of Dane fillings and now you get an essential torus, um, well, here, here's an example where the, the distance can actually be as much as eight, and so we're trying to find, you see, we're trying to get upper bounds for, for that. Um, and again, once we've done that, we also want to describe, hopefully, you know, uh, and more precisely, the examples that realize that. Well, in fact, l l let's, let's notice that it, um, the figure eight knot complement actually can be described like this. Um, well, oh, sorry, here's the figure eight knot. So that's the figure eight knot, I hope. Yeah, okay. And you can think of that, so the, so the figure eight knot exterior, you can think of starting with a whitehead link. And so you think of removing a neighborhood of this component. And then sort of blowing down this component with a minus one. Okay, so you do a thing surgery on one component of the whitehead link, you're going to get uh, a figure eight. Well, th there's another very closely related manifold, which is interesting, which you also get from the whitehead link. So again, this is going to be a manifold with a single torus boundary component. It'll be a hyperbolic manifold. And this time I'm going to do five surgery on uh, that component. And so this gives, so, so this gives the manifold M8, the exterior of the figure eight knot. This gives a manifold which is called M8 star or whatever. Um, this, is the, this is called the figure eight sister manifold. So this was dis dis discussed at length by Weeks in his thesis of the 80s. 
So why do I mention that, this manifold here? Oh, I should say that, yeah, I mean, there's actually a very close relation. It's perhaps not clear from this, but, you know, the figure eight knot exterior is, uh, is a, is a once-punctured torus bundle over the circle, you know, with a certain monodromy. And in fact, the, the figure eight system manifold, it's a once-punctured torus bundle over the circle where you change the monodromy by composing it with, you know, multiplication by minus the identity, you know, the, the hyperelliptic involution on the torus. So they're very closely related uh, manifolds. But anyway, uh, what these, well, anyway, so it turns out that one can prove the following theorem. Well, it, it turns out that this manifold also has a, a, a couple of uh, Dane fillings that give you uh, in, in, incompressible tori at distance eight. And so you can prove, you can prove the following theorem that, uh, you know, sort of M hyperbolic, uh, M alpha, M beta, uh, toroidal, in other words, contains an essential torus, then, well, first you can prove that, in fact, 8 is the, is the maximum possible value for the intersection number. And also, uh, that if, if you are at this maximum, well, this is equal to 8, if and only if M is M8 or M8 star. So there are precisely two manifolds that, 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 that realize that. So th that's, a ki that's a kind of theorem that uh, I'm sort of talking about in general. You want to sort of do this now. You see this, this keeps you employed for, for many years now because you've got all these different kinds of degenerations. You've got spheres, you've got this, you've got Hagard spheres, you've got annuli. And so you can go to town and try to figure out in all cases what, uh, what's the worst that can happen in terms of the uh, intersection numbers of, of, of the degeneration, degenerating uh, surgery slopes, and also can we somehow explicitly describe uh, the manifolds that, that uh, realize those. And so let me just say that, so A, well, this was me, actually. This is a, this is a very old theorem. I'm embarrassed to say when I proved it, but anyway, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's an old theorem, yeah. <laughs> this is old stuff, yeah. Um, so I was going to say that uh, th th this is almost solved, uh, again, except, let's see, did I, I probably erased it. Does anybody mind if I use this blackboard too? Okay, okay, yeah, uh, that might give me more. Um, it's almost solved, again, except, well, of course, if you remember the, the, the cases, I mean, the exceptional, I mean, zero was the counter example of the geometric conjecture. Okay, we're not going to talk about that. Um, but the, the small socket fiber case is also, uh, is also pretty open. I mean, uh, that's the least understood by a long way. Um, and so, in fact, if you stay away from those cases, then this is almost solved. In fact, the, the maximum values of the intersection numbers between the various kinds of degenerations are actually given by the following table. So let me just record this. So there are six uh, possible Oops, wait, that wasn't so good. All right. Okay, so here you see we could have, uh, by this obviously I mean that, you know, you have some filling M alpha that gives rise to an essential sphere or an essential disk, special essential torus, or you also have, let, let, let's put everything up, you could also have the case of a Hagard sphere, in other words, that's just F3, or a Hagard torus, which is just, well, a lens space provide, you know, I mean, <laughs> S1 cross S2 is possible, but that's covered by this, and S3 is possible, but that's covered by this. And so we have, for, for all these possible pairs, right, you see, we have, um, and so you can ask, what's the maximum distance? Well, you see, I've already mentioned one, T, 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 right, is eight. So that means that if you have a hyperbolic manifold, you do two day infillings, each of which is toroidal, contains an essential torus, the ma then the maximum intersection of the number, well, the intersection number has to be at, at most eight. <coughs> and so anyone, one can fill out in 
I see, I don't remember them all. Right. Okay, so for, let, let's notice that, I mean, a couple of cases simply here don't, I mean, they, they, these don't mean anything, because here you'd be saying that uh, on one filling would give you the three sphere, the other filling would give you an essential disk, but I mean, that's, you only have an essential disk if you have non-empty boundary, right? So, 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 so these just don't make sense. Um, sorry, there's one more. Um, and so there are two, there are two that are, uh, precisely two that are unknown. So again, I mean, let's just uh, look at this. I mean, th so, so this one, for example, this is a theorem I mentioned last time that says that you, you, you can't get the three sphere by two different uh, fillings, you see. And, uh, and then, th let's see which one. Um, this one says that if you have a hyperbolic knot in the three sphere and you do a day in surgery, it gives you a toroidal manifold then the distance is most two. So that was the theorem about the denominator, L, remember, being at most two. And again, that, that is realized. So all, the, all these numbers are best possible. Uh, ex I mean, these, these are the right answers, except these two. So let me just mention the two, the two open, open problems there. Is that something for you to think about? By the way, for obvious reasons, this is called the Fibonacci table, right? Here. <laughs> Right, so, uh, so the, the, unknown, the unknown cases, okay, first of all, there's the one uh, where we're talking about um, one filling that gives you this, a reducible manifold and one filling giving you the, uh, the sphere. Well, so what does this mean? I mean, I've, I've already, actually already discussed this, this question, right, because this says, that, this says that you have a hyperbolic knot in S3 because you've got that filling there, and then you've got another filling, so you've got a Dane surgery on this guy that contains an essential sphere. So this guy, you know, is reducible. It's either S1 cross S2 or a connected sum. Now, as I mentioned last time, Gabay's theorem tells you that, in fact, it can't be S2 cross S1, but it's still not known whether or not it could be a non-trivial connected sum. So, so just recall that this is uh, this, this shouldn't happen. So, the, so the, the entry there should be sort of minus infinity or something. Uh, but that's unknown, and this is probably one of the main open questions about Dane surgery or not in S3, it seems to me. This is essentially the so-called cabling conjecture. The, o the other uh, one that's not known is perhaps not so interesting, but just for the sake of completeness, you, you'd like to know what the answer is. So, so here, what this means is that you've got, a, you've got a hyperbolic manifold and you've got one filling that gives you a, a lens space and you've got another filling that gives you uh, an essential torus and you'd like to know what's the worst that can happen there in terms of the intersection number. Well, it, and it's known that it's actually, it's somewhere between three and five in other words, it, it's, it's known that it can't be more than five, and there are infinitely many examples that realize three, so it's either three, four, or five. And it can't be four, because four isn't the Fibonacci number, so there's only two possibilities, <laughs> right? Probably three, probably three. And again, uh, you know, so this, so A, I should also say that B, I mean the second, the second sort of goal is of actually describing the manifolds that realize these maximal values of delta, it's also solved in many cases. So e.g. the theorem I mentioned above about the, the torus case. And so I, I won't list all the others, I mean, but in, in many cases the, the answer is no. All right. So, for example, here, right, I mean, this is, this is the theorem I mentioned sort of somewhere uh, last time about non-integral toroidal surgeries on hyperbolic knots in S3. I mean, uh, 
these Udavi Munoz not. So there, you know, the, the picture is completely known. And so somehow one would like a complete picture of that kind uh, for, all the other, for all the other cases. But of course, let me just, uh, at this point, of course, appropriate to mention that uh, the, the main problem, perhaps, was uh, to do something about the case when one of these guys is a, is a small Seifert fiber space. So, I mean, I, as I've said, so you want to solve A and B when one or both M alpha and beta is a small Seifert fiber space. So th there are some things known. I mean, uh, in fact, let me just take this opportunity to mention uh, th th there, are, there are several results, but um, th there's, no complete, there's no complete answer. But th th there are some good theorems by Boyer and Zhang, for example. So here's just an example. Uh, in the case when the small Seifert fiber space has finite fundamental group, in other words, when it's a, you know, a spherical manifold, then uh, th they have some very good results on that case. And so here's a couple of statements. Um, that if, uh, you know, M is always hyperbolic, I won't keep on saying that, all right? Um, that if pi 1 of M alpha and pi 1 M beta finite, then in fact uh, the intersection number is at most 3. And again, you know, in the case of knots in the 3 sphere, uh, we're interested in, you know, so K hyperbolic, in S3, and uh, suppose we do, again, suppose this, suppose this guy has finite pi 1. Then rem remember, really, we, we like to prove that L is 1, right? That was a kind of problem. In, in fact, well, so, but, so they can sh show that at least in this finite fundamental group case, it's at, at most 2. And, uh, Okay, so let, and let and I should just mention that, in fact, that the first the first part of the theorem, the first theorem, there is actually best possible. So I'm just about to erase the the key example here. But so let me leave it up. So uh, one is actually best possible. It's realized by um, there exists alpha beta intersection number three uh, on the boundary of the figure eight sister. And there, you get, there are two fillings of this guy. Uh, spherical manifolds. Actually of type of, you know, this, the, the tetrahedral type, two, three, three. So the, the Seifert fiber spaces over the two, so with three singular fibers, multiplicities two, three, and three. Finite fundamental loop. So, so, so that's a good result. Okay. So let me, uh, in the remaining sort of half of the lecture, um, say a little bit of something about at least one set of techniques that one can use to approach these problems. Okay, well, uh, so I've said that, uh, that uh, a lot of these degenerations from, from hyperbolicity to non-hyperbolicity can, can be expressed in terms of the, uh, suddenly these, these surfaces with non-negative Euler characteristics show up. And so, suppose then, so, so one can use that topological um, sort of characterization of the degeneracy to, to to approach the problem in the following way. So suppose you've got this, you know, this manifold M, hyperbolic, compact, probably you might as well assume it's hyperbolic, and suppose we've got some uh, pair of Dane fillings, so I'll now call it alpha 1 and alpha 2 rather than alpha and beta, and suppose each of these guys contains some surface, which I'll call sort of Fi hat. So let's assume that these two filling slopes are, 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 are different. So, remember what we did to do this Dane filling. We took M and we attached a solid torus 
Jaco VI. And now, what do you see in this manifold M alpha I? Well, you see the solid torus VI, and you see its core, so here's VI, I'll call its core CI, and that's the kind of knot that shows up in the surgical manifold. And we're, we're supposed to have this surface FI hat. Well, so make this surface FI hat transverse to the core, to this knot, and we're going to see, maybe I'll use a color here, uh, oh, but red's probably as good as anything. Uh, you see this surface sort of crashing through uh, this solid torus in a bunch of meridian disks, okay? And then outside here, you know, you, you see the, here's the surface, the various sheets of the surface that are crashing through, okay? So here's sort of Fi hat. And so if you now just remove the uh, Vi, so this gives rise to a surface which I'll just call Fi in M, right? With boundary, <coughs> well, uh, with, you know, Fi hat is equal to Fi union, some, some meridian disks in Vi, right? And so the boundary of the surface F just consists of some copies of this meridian. And remember, this meridian, by definition, because we did the alpha I surgery, all the alpha I filling, they're just copies of this curve of slope alpha I. So, so boundary Fi consists of a certain number of copies of, uh, of alpha I. And so you can sort of number these guys, one, two, up to Ni. Okay, and so you get these two surfaces, you see. Uh, notice also that, so we, we've now got these two surfaces sitting in the same manifold M, right? And notice that on the boundary, we know exactly what the picture is. Well, the, the boundary, uh, this is on T0, this is the, the boundary component, the torus boundary component that we're doing the, the, the filling on. And so, you know, on this we're going to see the boundary of F1. So here it maybe it consists of four copies there, as in this case. And then we also see the boundary of the other surface. Um, well, the components of the other surface, they, they sort of wrap around some number of times. And we're going to see several of those. I'll just draw one, but I mean, we, we're going to see a lot of parallel copies of this. And, of course, the number of times that a blue component, that's the boundary of F2, intersects a red component is precisely, you know, the intersection number of alpha 1 and alpha 2. So, you see that, uh, that each component, so each, each component of boundary F1 intersects each component of boundary F2 in exactly delta, which delta points, okay? And I'm assuming delta is greater than zero. In other words, these curves are definitely uh, not isotopic. Well, now you see, now you're all set to actually uh, analyze this situation by looking at the intersection of these two surfaces, F1 and F2. They both sit in the same manifold M, the original hyperbolic manifold M, and you know exactly what their boundaries, uh, how their boundaries intersect. Uh, and now you can study the intersection of the whole thing. And so you can set up a kind of machine which, by which you can analyze uh, th those intersections. So, so let, let's, let, let me try to say what you do here. So, uh, so, so now you get, um, so F1, the intersection of F1 and F2, they give you sort of graphs in F, Fi hat. Well, they give you a graph gamma i in Fi hat, i equals 1, 2, <coughs> where the, the vertices of gamma i, they just correspond to the 
punctures in the, uh, in the surface that correspond to these meridian discs. So they, they just correspond to the discs. You know, fi hat intersect vi, right? So think of them as big sort of fat vertices. And, uh, and then the edges, you think of the edges, this is just a way of sort of thinking. Um, well, they're just the arc components of F1 intersect F2. Because if you have two surfaces in the intersecting in a three-manifold, and you know that their boundaries intersect in points, well, there have to be arcs of intersection joining pairs of, uh, pairs of intersections on the boundary. And so you get this kind of pattern of intersections, and um, there's one more, I'll put up a, a little slide in a minute. It turns out that it's useful to put in one more, well, a, a couple of more little bits of information when you start analyzing these things. Uh, we numbered the components, uh, you know, one through N1, one through N2, the components of these two surfaces, and uh, it's convenient. You see, you can record all this information. You can label the endpoints of the edges uh, of gamma I, with the, with the label, well, with the number, the number of the corresponding component of the other surface, Fj. So I, I and J are one, one and two, and I is equal to J. And uh, I'll, I'll put up an example in a minute. And then, uh, and then there's one more thing you can do. You, can, you need to take, it turns out you, you need to take orientations into account. I mean, it's very useful to observe that these boundary components, because everything in, in town is orientable, if you orient, um, uh, uh, orient the surface Fi, you know, then, then these boundary components will, will, there'll be some induced orientation on the boundary there. And so you can, you can assign signs to these boundary components. In other words, remember, they're, they're just the vertices of the graph gamma i. So, so you can assign uh, sort of plus or minus to the vertices of gamma i according to the orientation of boundary fi, you know, on, on T0. So I should say that th th this whole technology was uh, of looking at these graphs. This was introduced by, by Rick, Rick Litherland. He, back in 1980, he was studying Dane surgery on satellite nodes, which we, we mentioned a while ago. And so, I'm sorry? Oh, did I? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, right. Okay, well, l l let me uh, cheat at this point and just show you what I mean here by giving, uh, showing a couple of transparencies, because it takes a while to draw these things, right? I mean, because you have a lot of uh, stuff to record. So, so here's, here's, a, here's a picture, you see, um, of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, wait, there we are. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess I've, ju I've just drawn the surface F1 hat. In this case, I've just drawn it as a sphere. I mean, I mean, you could put you could put in some bits of genus if you wanted, right? I mean, I didn't. Um, and you see, so here we have six punctures. Okay. So there's a green surface F1, and there's going to be a purple purple surface F2. And the green surface has six boundary components. And so um, N1, you see, is, is six. And there are four components of the other surface. And so that means that as you run around each green curve, you see you meet all the four components of the other surface, the boundary of the other surface, once. One, so you see one, two, three, four. You meet them in order. I've assumed here, just for the sake of drawing the picture, that delta is one. So each green curve meets each purple curve uh, exactly once. If it was, if delta was two, you'd see one, two, three, four, and then you'd see one, two, three, four again. So that's what I mean by this labeling. You see, you label uh, the endpoints of the edges of this graph with the corresponding boundary component on the other graph, okay, the other surface. And so you get this pat pattern of, uh, and I've also indicated the, the orientations. Oops. And so the other graph might look like this. There's only four punctures, you see. And uh, now this graph has valency six because that's the number of boundary components on the other graph. And these edges, of course, are in one-one -one correspondence, right? They're just uh, arcs of intersection. So, so this edge here, for example, you see, it, it joins, it's an arc of intersection of F1 and F2. And it, on F2, it joins boundary component one to boundary component four. 
and it joins the point where boundary component 1 meets boundary component 6 of the other surface to the point where boundary component 4 of this one meets boundary component 2 of the other surface. So in the other graph, this should appear as an arc joining vertices 6 and 2 with labels 1 and 4. And so that's, there you are, you see it, it joins labels uh, 6 and 2 corresponding labels 1 and 4. So you get this sort of, uh, you can record uh, this intersection you know, in, in, this, in this way, just by, these, by this pair of graphs, okay? And so now, I mean, I'm, you can now go to town and start analyzing uh, such graphs and hopefully get somewhere. Well, there's one, there's one sort of b very basic point that, you know, you're clearly going to need some sort of essentiality condition, I mean, some non-triviality condition, because your surfaces you know, F1 hat and F2 hat could have been completely trivial. They could have just been local surfaces in some coordinate neighborhood. And obviously, you're not going to get any mileage out of that, because they always... So, so what's the non-triviality? Well, <laughs> it's sort of surprising. Well, f f first of all, you need, you know, you need N1 and N2 to be greater than zero. I mean, in other words, you don't want this surface to be completely disjoint from, from the core. So you, so you don't want F one hat or F2 hat to lie entirely in M, so you, you need, need non-empty graphs, in other words. But, but the other key condition, and it's very surprising that this is, suffices, uh, you need this condition that no, it's very natural, no arc of F1 intersect F2, in other words, no edge of either of these graphs is boundary parallel uh, in F1 or F2. So. I mean, this is pretty clear. It's pretty clear that if you don't have this, you're not going to get anywhere. Anyway, so what I mean is this. I mean, locally, you know, at a vertex of gamma 1, you're going to see, I don't know, you're going to see all these uh, edges emanating out, you know, with various labels on them. And what you don't want, you don't want that to be some totally trivial sort of arc of intersection that could just be sort of pushed into the boundary. Because uh, if you think about it, I mean, you can always come up with trivial examples of surfaces. Uh, with, with these trivial intersections. And it's so sort of surprising to me that actually this sort of obvious necessary condition turns out to be sort of sufficient really to get started. And uh, let me say a circumstance is under which you can achieve it. So you can actually achieve uh, this condition star uh, if either... There are two important conditions under which you can uh, achieve this. And this is good for our, um, for our program, if you think about it. Uh, <coughs> Well, if for i equals 1 and 2, either, well, either f i hat could be an essential surface in its, in, in its manifold, and bearing in mind this condition, you don't want to be able to sort of push it off c i, you know, entirely into m, otherwise you'd lose, uh, you'd lose, uh, I mean, there wouldn't be a graph, okay. Uh, and, so one way to say this is, and um, M does not contain sort of any essential su surface, sort of homeomorphic to Fi hat. I mean, that's perhaps one way to say it. Um, so, and again, this is good because, you know, we're starting with something that's hyperbolic, let's say, and so it doesn't contain any interesting essential surfaces, probably. I mean, it doesn't contain an essential sphere. Now we're doing some Dane filling, and now perhaps an essential sphere shows up. So we have precisely this situation. And then the other case that's interesting, from the point of view of Hagar surfaces, another thing that you can do is, is it, it turns out, <coughs> and this is not nearly so obvious, but if, if Fi is a Hagar surface, uh, and Mi hat, uh, and again, there's a sort of non-triviality condition here. You don't want this core, this curve, CI, to be isotoped onto onto the surface. So in other words, uh, you, you want this curve to, you know, it's forced to sort of intersect the, the surface transversal. You can. Any, anyway, uh, and this, establishing this condition in this case, uses thin position. It's, a, it's slightly, definitely a more uh, non-trivial 
Uh, uh, definitely, a more, uh, you know, a more trivial statement. Anyway, so the, the, there are these, you know, this is, I mean, from the point of view of the program I was outlining, the, the, these, these, these are the conditions that, that we have, you know. Um, and so we can now get going on a analyzing these intersections of these surfaces because we can assume that they're non-trivial in, uh, in the sense that they satisfy that condition stuff. Okay, so now let me just give some, a very quick sort of example of the kind of things that you can prove. I obviously not going to have very much time to say much, but um, here's, here's the philosophy. The philosophy is that suppose you've got a face of one of these graphs. So let's go over here. So if you look at one of these graphs, gamma 1, look at this face here, for example, this disk. Well, so let's say that D is a face of gamma i. Well, D a face of gamma 1. Let's, let's be specific here. And so you're going to see, you know, it comes from this graph. So you're going to see something like this. I assume that D is a disk. Usually is. And so what, what the boundary of D consists of are these edges, which are just arcs of intersection of the surface with the other surface, and then these corners. And they have these consecutive labels, you see. You might see something like that. This would be plus, plus, minus, plus. And you can see examples of that over here. Well, now, so how, do you, how might one think of this disk? Well, you see, you could think of this disk as actually sitting in the other manifold, the manifold M alpha 2. <laughs> and the boundary of the disk, I'll draw a picture in it, but the boundary of this disk uh, lies in, part of its boundary lies in, you know, the, the surface F2. Those are the edges. And then the other parts of the boundary lie in, <coughs> well, well, well they, they, they lie in T0. They lie in the boundary of the, you see, the, the, these punctures were lying on the, on the torso you did the filling in. And so, so these, these are the sort of edges, and these are the, co you know, these are the corners. These are the edges and the corners. And so, so over, in M, over in the other manifold, M alpha 2, you see, you see the, the following sort of picture. Here's F2 hat, let's say, this horizontal surface. And then it's punctured by, by, the, um, by the torus, the solid torus that you attach to do the, the Dane filling. So here's your torus uh, V2. And you see all these places where it punctures through, and th they're all numbered, you know. These boundary points are numbered 1, 2, 3, and so on. And so in particular, you'll see sort of, you think of these as one handles. This might be labeled K. This will now, this will be labeled K plus 1 because it's, it's the next one along. And so you think of this piece of the solid torus as being like a, a one handle. And you see, what, what, what does the boundary of this guy look like? So let's use some colors. There are edges which are blue, and there are corners which are red. Well, you see, the corners correspond to running over. So, th so here you're running over the boundary torus, T0, and you're going from boundary component 1 of F2 to boundary component 2. So something like this will show up as an arc like that. And then you have some blue guys. Well, then, then you're just kind of running around in the surface. And now you come to the next guy. And so you, then you run over the handle again. And then you sort of, I don't know, maybe you run back somehow. And you run over this handle again. And so on, right? And so you, and so the, the whole disk is actually sitting here and it's kind of stuck on in this fashion. And so the, the idea, the philosophy of, of this whole thing is that you, um, is that the faces, the faces of one graph sort of give you topological information about the other manifold. So faces of, well, so yeah, so gamma j, I alpha j. Okay. And so a simple example of this, so let me just give a, a kind of local example. Suppose you had a, a face of one of the graphs that looked like this, and the labels were all the same. There was one, two, one, two, one, two. So that, if you think about it, that means that these guys are all positively oriented. 
And suppose, uh, so this is what's called a Charlemagne cycle. Oops. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Almost. This is what's called a Charlemagne cycle. And so, um, if we also assume that our surface F2 hat, uh, so this is sitting in gamma 1, if the other surface was maybe, let's say, a two sphere or maybe a disk, doesn't really matter. Uh, what you're going to see, I mean, the only important thing that to worry about is you're going to see F2 hat sitting in there, and then you're going to see this handle, this one handle that runs from 1 to 2, part of the solid torus you, you glued in. And then wh what does this guy look like? Well, as I said, you've got these three corners and these blue edges, and so you're going to see a disc. In other words, you're going to see a two handle that's attached to this picture, and the two handle sort of goes over here, then it wanders around somewhere. But I'm assuming this is a, a sphere or a disk, so nothing interesting can really happen topologically. And now it now goes over this handle again, then it runs around, then it goes over this handle again, then it runs around, and well, in this case there's only three things and it closes up. And so you'll see that if you, ever, if you ever saw something like this in one graph, it would tell you that your other manifold had a lens space, a punctured lens space sitting in it, you see? This is exactly how you build a lens space, right? Take a sphere, let's say, or a disk, add a one handle, add a two handle, that just goes around, well, in this case, three times, so you'd get the lens, a lens space L3, 1. So this implies that M alpha 2 is a lens space connected some something else. Okay, so this may well be, may well be a contradiction. And so, that's a kind of local uh, example of something that gives you very strong topological information about the other about, about the other manifold. And so the idea is, I mean, you, 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 depending on the problem that you that you're faced with, depending on what surfaces, what kind of surfaces you're looking at. I mean, there may be tori. As I say, you're basically interested in these ones of negative, non-negative order characteristics. So there might be tori or spheres or disks or, or whatever. And depending on the precise uh, setting, there might be Hagar tori, there might be incompressible tori. Uh, you try to prove theorems like, um, so, so, so you, I mean, this is a sort of starting point of this kind of analysis. You, you, so, you, so you prove things which typically have the form that, that if uh, the distance, the, if the intersection number is greater than some function, some function of the Euler characteristics of the two surfaces, the two, then, then one of the two graphs, either gamma 1 or gamma 2, contains a set of faces which is useful. I mean, it gives you useful information. For example, if you ever saw a Charlemagne cycle, that would give you very strong information. It would tell you that you've got a lens space lurking around. So then either gamma 1 or 2 uh, sort of contains uh, sets of faces that, well, that, that are useful. So let, let's, uh, let me not uh, use them. And let me just finish off with one statement, one slightly more precise statement of this type than that one can prove. And I'll quit. Sorry, I'm going to run a couple of minutes over here. But, uh, so for example, it turns out one can prove the following. So, so this is something that John Luke and I proved quite a long time ago. But anyway, let's, let's uh, so for example, you can prove that if, um, let, let's take the simple case that, well, okay, let's just take the, assume that F1 hat, and if, let's assume they're both spheres, okay, uh, the, and suppose that delta is at least one, so it, it can't be any less than one, so this is good. Then either, so this is the type of statement we want to prove. Either um, gamma 1 <coughs> contains, well, contains one of these Charlemagne cycles, which gives you, which tells you that M alpha 2 must have a lens space sum under it, or, and then the second statement is a bit more complicated, but let me put it like this, gamma 2 contains a set of faces, which I'll call script D, such that if we then, bearing in mind this picture, if we then build the corresponding sub-manifold of M alpha 1, see now we're in gamma 2, so um, such that, so let me, let me call it M 
delta, uh, uh, sorry, m script d. So, I mean, what we can do, as I've sort of indicated here, you can just take a neighborhood of the, of the surface, f1 hat, this, this, whatever, it's a sphere, okay, thickened sphere. Now we've got all these one handles, you see. Well, that's, that's just v, v1, that, that, that's all it took. But think of them as the one handles, you know, on the two sides of the, of the product neighborhood. And now, now we can add neighborhoods of all the disks in this collection. You see, so you think of these as, so th these consist of one handles, and then these consist of sort of two handles. And of course, this is sitting, as I indicated, this is sitting in all in the manifold M alpha 1. So what's the punchline? The punchline is that uh, you can find this collection of faces such that this manifold, you, you build it this way, such that uh, the first homology of this manifold has, has non-trivial torsion. So that's just one, one example. So in particular, you know, it couldn't li sit in S3, right? Uh, and so as a corollary of that, you get, uh, <coughs> so hence, again, it's a VG, you know, you, let, let's put these two statements. If one of the guys uh, <coughs> is S3, so, so let's take the case where, let's take the case where, um, F1 hat and F2 hat are Hagard spheres. So that means that the, the two manifolds in question are the three sphere. Well, that's simply a contradiction because either one of the graphs contains a Schadamann side which gives you a lens space. Well, S3 doesn't contain any lens spaces. Or you've got this rather more complicated set of faces than the other guy which generates non-trivial torsion in H1, well, but S3 is a homology sphere, so you don't get that either. And so this implies that alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2. So that, that's the entry 0 in that table that I put up, you know, Hegel sphere, Hegel sphere. And let me just com finish by, by, by saying that, of course, it also comes out of this, that, again, if you've got a knot in the 3 sphere, so if M alpha 1 is, um, well, let's, let, let's, well, <coughs> oh, okay, if M alpha 1 is S3, uh, let's turn it around. If M alpha 2 is S3 uh, and M alpha 1 sorry, M alpha 2 reducible uh, well th th that implies that, remember this is this, this is this, this is this open problem we would like to say that if M is hyperbolic, then this simply doesn't happen at all. Uh, but what we can say is, it follows, is, is, it, is that M alpha 2 has a lens space somehow, see? Connected some, something else. And so in particular, uh, it can't be S1 cross S2, so you get a... Uh, you get another proof of, of this sort of property R. Because you see, uh, in this setting, we take F1 hat to be a Hagard sphere, we take F2 hat to be an essential sphere, and then the theorem says that, well, either you've got a Charlemagne cycle in gamma 1, well, that gives you a lens space sum and in this guy. That's what. Or if that doesn't happen, then you've got these faces that give rise to torsion. But that's impossible because this was, this was S3. Okay, so that's the kind of thing you could prove. And th there are many variations on this, and uh, like I say, depending on the, on the context, um, the theorem I mentioned again last time about, you know, non-integral surgeries on knots and S3 giving you tori, I mean, one of your surfaces will be a Hagard sphere, the other one is an essential torus. And you play similar games and you want to prove that delta can't be more than two, right? And then you want to get in there and analyze the situation uh, in even more detail uh, and eventually, again, taking this kind of setup as a starting point, uh, these, these, these sort of graphs, if you, you sort of analyze these sort of graphs, you get, you get finer and finer information about, about the topology of the, of, of the whole setup and eventually, let, for example, in that case, conclude that the knot has to be exactly one of these Udavi Munoz knots. So, so this is a sort of technique which uh, <coughs> is quite widely applicable, but uh, it, it, the precise form that it takes de often depends very much on the, on the, on the precise problem that you're trying to, trying to solve.
All right, thank you.